as I transition to introduce our first speaker, David Tepper, who is from Seattle, probably in here to do this for the fans of the mentioned here. And uh, David is a veteran at Microsoft and in the health industry. I believe he has over 18 years of experience in this. He just recently was asked to take over as a senior architect for Genii, right? And um, tell us a little more. Yeah, <laughs> it's got a wonderful presentation. And the good thing about it is it's not just a composed application of AI and how it is just Yes, involved with our online. Nice. So welcome, David. Please go ahead and thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Come on. Share the presentation. Rossi. Uh, good morning. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm David Timber. I went from Seattle yesterday, so I'm very happy. Uh, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm a PM architect on the Azure Vector. I have a PM on the Azure Vector. So, you know, we're going to talk about the Azure Vector. So, the problem that I'm going to say is the problem with AI or Lightning. And before I even talk about what the AI alignment is, I want to buy a background to really make sure you can understand the problem. And I'm going to begin by discussing the really small problem. And that small problem is the whole of the uh, But specifically, as I mentioned, the technology of the time. So after we have stopped being nomads, we transform ourselves into the performing community to the end of the agricultural age. And this breakdown is made up in videos like Bonds and Iron and Iron and all the way through the Renaissance and the Roman Empire and things like that. But uh, ultimately, during the time, even during the Roman Empire, there's 85 to 90% of the population was farm and food for that population to survive. It's absolutely the end of the technology that they use farming. And as a result, the wars that they fought, the weapons that they used were all farming related. They fought with blades, bows and arrows, spears, they really on animals. Things like that. And to this day, it is as bad as the reaper. I think the farm in the scenario site where a sickle in farming school still back thousands of years. The invention of the power of mechanical farming transformed sites so that one person is farming up for 100 years. But with that, we left the agricultural and the mechanics. This came with some major shifts to the world economy, uh, over politics, and just our day to day, like the assembly line, the industrial revolution, and the weapons that we start. But chips, airplanes, heating guns, tanks, all really all in the name of the weapons. And these weapons, of course, do not contain more power than anything that they can afford. They affected the much more data. The invention of the internet in the 1980s made us leap in accurate accurate information. Now, virtually all money is digital, and you can't show me a single government that is running on some form of technology. It doesn't seem to be silly. In the 1990s and early 2000s, we saw in, uh, what we now have to be traditional information weapons, things like viruses, electronic surveillance, state sponsored hackers, things like Scott's Managed, Scott, the Iran nuclear program, ransomware, things like that. But then it came to AI. And from it, it started in a very unique type of products, and with that, we tried to really experience social media. Social media is an AI product. They leverage machine learning to understand our preferences, to increase engagement, and show us more relevant advertising. In order to keep you scrolling and TikTok for as long as possible, the algorithms learn what will keep you present. That is core. This form of AI is by curating the information that you see on a social media platform. And it was wildly successful. Most of the major tech companies are in some way gathering your data and then selling it back to you in the form of ads. But this also led to a completely unforeseen revelation. See, up until this point, the predominant wisdom was that sex sells, and that sexuality led to the highest engagement groups. And while sex certainly does sell, machine learning has a way of identifying patterns that humans do not. And it turns out the emotion which gets humans to spend the most amount of time on your platform isn't sex. It's rage. It's engagement. And AI taught this to human civilization. It taught something about ourselves that we didn't already know, or at least we didn't fully understand. The machine algorithms 
They don't miss this, right? It's not like Mark Zuckerberg is in there tweeting the numbers. They automatically into whatever the algorithm, whatever the numbers actually say. And so the symptoms were automatically prioritizing and circulating information, which led to the grade. When this drove up engagement so high, social media in general became a significant portion of the information that we all see and that we consume. And thus, the first AI-powered information weapons were born, and we used them against ourselves. We all know the effects of this one. We're living in Right? We have new cults like QAnon and 5G causes COVID. Uh, there's kids that want to look sexy on Instagram so they can get more likes. And though it's difficult to judge the number of lives lost, certain that the number of lives impacted is far higher than the number ever impacted by the weapons. And we're all still deeply vulnerable to these information weapons. But why? Well, to understand that, I want to look at our second really small topic reality. And to understand it better, I want to look at an example from the agricultural world. This is so bad. Specifically, I want to talk about this ancient Egyptian god because ancient Egyptians lived near the Nile River, and the land is mostly crocodile infested swamps. And they revered Sobek, and they believed that he could offer them protection from the dangerous crocodiles. If only they could build temples to worship. And so what they did is they underwent this massive civil engineering feat where they literally drained the swamps. Term, right, and erected these temples so that, and they fed the crocodiles and they made the land useful. So, inside their temples, they actually had an avatar, so that was a real crocodile, and they would put a crown on him, right? And they would worship him, and they would see him. And by worshiping so that, the Egyptians transformed the dangerous crocodile infested swampland into the ground on which they continued to build their civilization. So, that had come through for them. So my question to all of you is, was the god Sobek real? It was certainly real in the minds of the ancient Egyptians. And through that shared belief, Sobek's power was realized. And anyone living in that time that thought, doubt Sobek's power, was around. be like, well, look, look at all this. Like, it's not this. It was Sobek. This shared understanding between subjects about how the world works is called an intersubjective reality. And most of historians believe that this is actually, but not most, many historians believe this is actually the true source of human civilization's power. Things like money, governance, religions, all of them represent shared understandings. And we, they have power because we ascribe them to that power. Money only works because we live in an introspective reality with money and necessities. Religious civilizations dominate human history because they have a shared purpose, they have to unify the cause. It's a non religious civilization that didn't have that, simply went to the wayside. We're here in Miami Dade County. Miami Dade County doesn't exist. It only exists in the intersubjective reality that we live in. And if you point to the law of where it's defined, you'll soon find out that the law itself is an intersubjective reality, as is our faith and its traditions. But the beautiful thing about being human is that when you create an idea and you establish it in the minds of others, we collectively need to create it. So let's dive into this more deeply. The fervor with which people will defend their reality is a function of how established it is in their minds. So think of religious wars like the Crusades. People would suit up in heavy armor for more than 200 years, and they would march thousands of miles to go fight other people who had a of reality that were different from their own. Or the Tulip Mania in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, where by 1637, a single tulip bowl was worth as much as 10 times the annual income of a skilled laborer. And they look back on them and say, man, people are morons. But they weren't. They were just as intelligent as you and I. They just believed different stories. That's actually how much tools were worth to them. And you may think that our modern civilization is immune to this kind of thing, but have you seen the price of Bitcoin lately? What curation AI does is it hyper focuses the information it generates. So, in the same way that the type of food that you consume will change your body, the type of information that you consume will affect your mind. And when you curate which thoughts are exposed to wide portions of the population, you're curating the stories that we tell ourselves, and therefore curating the realities that we choose to live in. And since these realities are so powerfully and consistently reinforced, we vigorously defend them. And we'll take action to realize, which is why, despite having the most advanced communications technology in the world, 
we can't agree on who won the last election. And which is why, despite having satellites in space, there's a growing number of people who suddenly believe the Earth is flat. The last question, I agree with you, that's funny. Social media gives us our feed, but it is not a balanced information diet. This was our first encounter with wide scale AI. I would argue that the information age ended in November of last year when ChatGPT became available to the public, thus introducing what I'm calling here the intelligence age. Generative AI will usher this age in force, and what used to take 85 to 90 intelligent workers will soon take one or less. And this is likely to happen at incredible speed, far faster than the hundreds of years of the agricultural revolution. The economic and political implications of this are still unclear. But what we do know is that if Eurasian AI selects our reality for us, what generative AI does is make new ones. So we now have a technology which now not only enables automated creation of satellites, but also new religions. It creates synthetic parasocial relationships that have left unchecked and lead to total trust collapse. AI is gaining a mastery of communication at a level that goes far beyond the understanding and capability. And in so doing, it is gathering all the keys, unlocking all the doors of all of our institutions from governments to towns. The de definition of cybersecurity has always included social engineering facts. But how do we think about that differently when it is society itself which is at risk of being engineered? I'm sure you're all familiar with the text generation capabilities for our climate models. But that is not the only generative AI revolution that's happening right now. I want to show you a few examples. So here's four pictures of groups of donuts. I'll give you a second to look at these. Three of these are real. One of them is AI generated. And by a round of applause, who thinks it's the top right? That's fake. I guess not. Three are real, one is fake. Let's start with the top right. Who thinks the top right is fake? Right around the boss. Let's hear it. Yes, I'm in. Who thinks it's this one right here? No people think it's this one. What about right here? Two people. Bottom left. And the truth is, they're all fake. If you can talk about that. They're actually not all fake. Three are real. One is fake. Doesn't matter. What matters is we can all agree. Hmm. The technology is already being weaponized. This image was made in stable diffusion. This is a text to image generation software. This was made in seconds, circulated on Twitter. This one here. When I got this one off of Twitter, it had 411,000 likes. This was created with mid journey, it's created in seconds. Now, we've heard a lot of the news lately about aliens. It's a good thing that we've got somebody on the inside who can be there in the portal, so. Now, these images could, could always have been photoshopped, right? Like, that's, that, that's not new. But the speed and ease at which they can be made allows for deployment of fake imagery in a rate that was never possible, right? And as these tools evolve, it will become increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to tell what is reality. But this doesn't just stop the news. Sure. Some players have seen minor improvements, but it's still not up to par with what they had before the mid-season update. Yeah, one more time for you. So this is a completely synthetic movie of everyone's favorite uh, news cast, uh, news anchor here. Let's listen to that one more time. Sure. Some players have seen minor improvements, but it's still not up to par with what they had before the mid-season update. So there's a little bit of audio line. Uh, and imagine this voice. Uh, this is never said these words. Right? Because you never said these words, you think it's a good point. Sure. Some players have seen minor improvements, but it's still not up to par with what they had before the mid season okay. update. Uh, this was an AI power picture service in Germany. There was AI avatars similar to Tucker Carlson that you just saw. The words were all written by chat. It actually responded to lies of questions. It was hundreds of people who attended, and the exit interviews were overwhelmingly positive. This is a research tool called Dragon. GAN stands for Generative Adversary. 
adversarial networks. You can see here there's actually two neural networks that are fighting each other. One of them is an expert at spotting fake content. You know, the one is an expert at generating fake content. And the generator continues to make better and better fakes until it gets spotted by it, until it doesn't get spotted by the detector. And then the detector gets smarter because it knows that it was just tricked. So these are two neural net engines that are teaching each other how to do whatever things. Now, believe it or not, this technology is not two generations old. It's pretty amazing stuff. But this is just the beginning. So what I've shown you so far is actually the automated exploitation of information age threats. What's coming down the pipe? What are the new intelligence age threats? And for that, I want to talk about our third small pipe. In the beginning, there was eukaryotic bacteria. Doesn't have the same range. Um, no, but life, life version 1.0. Its physical makeup was completely designed, or sorry, it was completely evolved uh, through natural selection. Right? And its behavioral systems were also completely evolved by natural selection. Once this bacteria was born, it could never learn anything new. So it would seek out sugar, it would seek out light, and that's it. And it would know how to fight. But if it got defeated, it wouldn't like you know come to its senses, realize how to go back and fight in a different way the next time. No, it's basically a biological algorithm, right? And that eventually evolved into the second version of life, which includes dogs, and humans, and so on, where our physical makeup is evolved. We can make small changes to it, but you can't make your brain ten times bigger than the size of it. But our decision-making processes are designed. We can learn new things. We can decide to go left instead of right. right? We can adjust over time. Now, that evolutionary advantage means that we never have anything to fear of life version 1.0. Even if there was a eukaryotic bacterium the size of Godzilla that was rampaging through the streets, it could never learn anything. So it would identify how to defeat it, it would defeat it, and move on with our lives. Now, before understanding the next variant of life, we need to look at more. So any computer scientist can tell you what Moore's law is. It was originally stated in 1971, which is basically saying that the number of transistors, the number of thinking or processing elements on a processor doubles every two years. This has been actually startlingly accurate since 1971. It has doubled every two years, leading to an exponential growth in the number of transistors on a processor, which is graphed here in logarithmic scale. But what happens if an AI is smart enough double the number of transistors for itself? Well, that means that the first time that it does so, it will take two years. But then, running on that twice as fast hardware, the next time it will take itself one year. And then it'll take half a year. But what ends up happening is the rate of acceleration of force law itself becomes exponential. And critically, humans are not in control of that second exponential. And I put that in perspective if this process starts in 2023. And by the year 2030, the time it takes for an AI to double its own speed is less than three days. But what's scarier is that we'll have been doubling the entire time. And so in a very short amount of time, the entirety of computing history, all of that speed would be so insignificant next to the AI that it won't be perhaps as zero. This is the beginning of what's called life frequency. Its decision-making processes are designed, just like ours, to learn new things and adjust on the fly. But its physical makeup is not evolved. It is also designed. It can make its brain 10 times bigger because it wants to. And then it can operate and stop that and brain to continue making its brain 10 times bigger because it wants to. Now, if such a big change to exist, it would have nothing to fear for versions of life that came before. The difference in intelligence was and it's only here and now that I can talk about AI movements. So it's about making sure that the intelligences that we design are aligned with the human values and interests that we all have. This observation of the double exponential of the worst law is actually what led us to the creation of the field of AI line more than 20 years ago. But this field has received virtually no funding because up until recently, AIs that can do this type of thing were through the kind of setup. Turns out that invented AI is starting to feel not so hypothetical anymore. So this field is starting to pick up in its interest, but it's much too slow. And part of the reason why it's much too slow is we don't have a good definition of superintelligence. People think about superintelligence, they think of like a chess expert who went to double college, like a stubby professor who's sitting in a corn cob pipe 
something like that. We don't associate things like anger with persuasiveness or charisma. I'm the top side. Clearly, I'm not super involved. This is a very different field of research. It's actually unique among fields of research because the scientific process assumes infinite time and retries. Formulate a hypothesis, you test it, you learn from that, you retry it, you continue. But the issue is that we have no idea why our intelligence is important. Our algorithms for machine intelligence are based on the study of brains and biological intelligence. So Dewey's going to explain how it works. You can't do it mathematically, but no one can tell you why it works. You don't know the why of the problems. So this means that we're going to take that next step to produce super intelligence, and we're not going to know why. It's not going to be a time where we create a super intelligence that is not reliant on human values, and we get to scrap it, take a step back, and start over. And if you'd say, like, well, we created one in isolation, and uh, it didn't get out of isolation, so we, we realized that one's not aligned, we're just going to keep trying again. Yeah, sure, until we create one that's not isolated, because it's too smart to be isolated. And we have no idea of knowing when that's going to happen. For all the talk on evolution versus intelligent design, more and more organisms are starting to come from intelligent design. If you look at our engineered food, we have lab brown meat, 94% of all the soy meats in the world are GMO. And now we have AI. And as we discuss any idea that's firmly established in our minds, we will take action to make it real. So much like the ancient Egyptians and their belief that was so bad, this new form of intelligent design doesn't come from the clouds above. Coming from the clouds that we built right here on Earth. After listening to these talk for 25 minutes or so, it's possible that my works had some form of intellectual or even emotional impact on you. It may change the conversation that you have today, it may change the action that you have going forward in this field. Was my presentation written by AI? Let's see. Well, much like the donuts, you can't be sure. With that, I'll take questions. Hey, the uh, Carl Gucci, the uh, energy budget of hydrogen sorry, for the 25 percent of national energy uh, consumption. Uh, we have you can see a time when the AI is limited not by how fast it can be fixed, but how fast it can get in. Is the AI attempting to become a lot of efficient, or is it the computational processes of the AI um, so we could be more efficient as time was? Yeah, so I'll repeat the question because we're on mic for the first bit there. Basically, the uh, current hyper scale of community is 20 to 25% of power infrastructure and are these getting more efficient? Uh, is that probably the question? That probably the question. Okay, so uh, some stats here that I find are interesting. Carl and I spoke about this earlier. Um, if you, how many people want to remember these issues before? Most of you. GPT 4, when you ask it a question, Uses 540 teraflops for producing answers, 540 trillion floating point operations, which is enough power to charge your phone more than 30 times every time you ask it a question. Uh, models are getting bigger and smaller. So the Gemini model, which is being trained by how I Google, is expected to be 20 times the size of the four. Um, there's uh, GPT 5, which was patented about five or six weeks ago. Nobody knows the information on that yet. So, the amount of energy that we're going to consume as a species is already dropping 20 to 25% of the power to time scale, computing 80% of the power to data centers to kind of do virtually all of that power to see the So, there is, no, there is no single thing that humans are doing right now with more of our actual life produced energy than training the guys and the models are all going to get Do they get better though? The efficiency part of AI is growth. The question is, is this vision part of the AI's growth? Is the energy level going to become better? To be honest, I can't answer that, but I don't think the incentives are there. Maybe the incentives are spending money to produce 
the biggest possible models uh, as quickly as possible. Before it costs a little over $100 million. Uh, we risk Google's like $100 million. dollars for billions of dollars. I think they're not going to look how efficiency in the ground. Uh, wait for that. Um, during your presentation, you used the word fear multiple times. And, you know, when we first started with option, people were talking about fear of like that and what? And we're looking about fear of AI. How do we bridge this gap so that technology and sociology and law and everything else doesn't get out of sync with each other? It's a great question. So this technology is fundamentally different to many of the ones that came before. Right. So people fear nuclear weapons, people fear tanks, but a tank cannot produce its own ammunition. A nuclear weapon cannot decide to run on something. Right? I believe all of these kinds of technology are putting more and more tools in the hands of use. And so our fear is basically that you can always treat those from a This is a completely different kind of fear. This is about creating a technology that is capable of operating itself. So on the street, fear is fear. So the question is really not what type of fear is this? It's really how do we as technologists and movers and innovators really react or prevent or try to suppress that fear so that the good use of technology can be overcome, you know, the, the fearful ones. So the, the question is, uh, you want to how do we technologists overcome the fear that steer it's fear of the technology? Um, I think I would disagree with the axiom of the question. We don't, I personally don't think we should be discounting the fear associated with this particular technology. I think that we're not fearful enough of this right now. Um, we're so dedicated to spending so much energy, physical energy, and also money on creating these incredibly powerful tools. We're not actually looking at this as we might accidentally create something that would bring about significant changes to uh, the explosive negative So I, I, hear, I hear the question, but I'd like to, like to talk with you uh, maybe on the phone. So I saw that hand out there with the source. You got to go to the source. Is a traditional keyboard. What is the future of the good What is the future of the person? I don't have a bad box of consciousness. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's consciousness, then there's no good scientific communication process. Uh, but the question about our third uh, communication with computers is with keyboard. Uh, GPT 4 itself, they haven't released the image of human phones yet because they're already at capacity. So you can throw images at CPT4 if you have the right access, and we'll look at them, and then we'll have a conversation with you about the images. You can snap that with this, right? Uh, that's only you can see the We can also talk to Whisper, which is a different AI, which will convert your uh, audio into text and can be fed and into uh, more traditional LMS and things like that. So all the forms of communication that we have with each other, it's not very long before we'll have those with AIs. Yes, the question is Will computer vision models the same policy architecture as sort of the GPT is built on the transform architecture, which is uh, originally done for language translation? It's been discovered that it works for all sorts of things because anything can be quantized and considered, right? So the radio waves in this room are a type of language. So I can convert those, I can feed that through a transformer, and all of a sudden, I Side. Okay. Um, so uh, if you can quantize uh, the recorded feed of a video into a language, right, and then train a model to understand that using the same architecture, GPT four's architecture, then absolutely uh, it will be better computer vision than probably convolutional neural networks, things like that that were used for uh, uh, for. Computer vision in the past. That's not clear. I mean, I, I know that it's been done. I don't think that uh, I don't think that it has been uh, done that yet. I know that a Gemini can be trained on YouTube, and YouTube receives um, 500 days worth of content every minute. I still have enough 
video. Uh, something that's my uh, I, I saw the number of the brief for the, the base suit pass. Actually, let me just say my entire talk will address that question. I want to Hi, uh, I wanted to talk about the first generation of generative AI that's finished. Uh, we're seeing now, like you said, these silos of information, silos that we're actually creating groups of people that have become alarming and we figured out how to exploit that market more outreach. As you said, the silos product. How in the next generation we fix this kind of obvious intentional misinformation product? So, the, the, the first Gen of AI is what was curation AI, it wasn't generative. Um, uh, and I don't think we have a good answer for information weapons uh, in general. And if you think about this, imagine for this technology, imagine we're held around the internet and it's like three sort of times. And uh, everybody in that, uh, that hub thinks something that you don't think is true. Now you're an exile, right? How do you fix that? Like we're we're that, that actually addresses a really fundamental part of our our human brain population. Right? Our human psychology is directly influenced by that. And you know that that's true. Like in society, you know that that's true. And you can ask yourself one simple question to understand whether or not these messages that you're getting are accessing like parts of your brain that may not be your frontal cortex. No matter how much time you spend on it, no matter how much lightning and swiping and tapping and responding and getting notifications, distracting all day. When was the last time you had a tree about your phone? Anyone? Okay. Uh, uh, are other uh, I know. I'm involved with the next one. I'm not going to change the If it's smart at the rate you describe on a chart, I worry about one of those changes being. Large all the eye work. So you see the little letter, this is you know, massive amount of other equipment. Is that 100 balls? Everything changes based on the time horizon. It's a great question. Um, the, we don't know when these types of inflection processes are going to be bought. That's part of the problem, right? We know that we know two things. We know that uh, they get better at scale and then they get independent increase. That's what we know. We don't know when that tipping point is. They haven't merged the functionality of all the time because they're being trained. For instance, GPT-4 makes perfect version instead of training a single line of version. Okay. Uh, so, like, it was a surprise to the team that was working on it. There's no data that makes sense for it. Yeah, it comes out, right? So, there's emergent properties that they can't predict. That's going to be the type of thing that could take off a very quick, it's called a food scenario, where, like, food all of a sudden, all of a sudden, right? Or it could take a very, very long time. We don't know. And I think the amount of uh, the rapidity of the change will impact uh, how quickly you can adjust jobs and things like that. This is why I put the intelligence stage job is that unknown economic political impact. Like we're just literally. Oh, I think Hold on, question. I'm getting. Okay, sounds good. Gentlemen, you get this. Thanks, uh, Scary and exciting. Uh, you know, I worked in radiation uh, financial services, right? And, you know, I see what the government projects to do to control these industries. Um, this is the government that can't balance the budget and can't stop spending. So, either, right? So, what do you see? You know, why don't we get kids to a point where the intelligence of the AI is smarter than the government? Deal with like that. You're going to have you know, many positions about that knowledge that have no idea of how that should work. I don't argue with that. I don't argue with that. Yeah, I mean, like, with Mitch McConnell talking about, you know, like, you know, just the AI and how they have to enforce it. So, um, there, this is a very good question. Uh, what, have uh, what I will say is there's a study done on uh, when government. Uh, changes happen in civilizations. It has to do with when the rate of information, the amount of data that's being generated by the civilization, see the ability of governments, uh, the ability of government to process that. Okay. Uh, and uh, if we're not already long, there, we're certainly not. Well, 